we talked pretty much, I think we pretty well beat up the subject of having people uh, deposit rents directly into your account, but uh, stay up on top of the, the new bank policies on that and try to get money to uh, tenants to do direct deposits for you. Uh, use a rental contract with incentives, like we went over here a couple minutes ago. Give your tenants a discount for paying on time. And collect a larger than normal security deposit. And then after they've inspected a house, moved in, the three days has gone up, make them responsible for the damage and the lack of maintenance to the house, okay, like stopped up plumbing. Um, next page, our mission statement. Our mission is to make a profit renting decent housing at fair rents to tenants who respect their homes and to promote and enforce an equitable relationship with those tenants. You should go home and work on that a little bit. Write down what your mission statement is because you need to have your head on straight about why you're in this business. You know, what, why are you doing this? Well, you're doing this to make money, aren't you? And you're doing this to make money how? How is you're providing decent houses for people at fair rents. You're going to maintain those houses, but you expect these people to do certain things. And you want to hold them accountable. So once you get this drilled in, it'll become part of you, and you'll know how to react. You know, you know how to react when tenants call you or you meet them on the street. You know, every once in a while I'll walk into my office and there'll be somebody sitting there and I will have no idea who they are. They could be a tenant, they could be somebody I owe money to, it could be somebody that owes me money, it could be some Habitat person or somebody else I've done business with over the years. Uh, and, you know, so knowing how to react when you, when you meet a tenant on the street, and you'll run into tenants on the street. I run into tenants in seminars sometimes. Ten, my tenants take my seminars. Are any tenants in here now? Probably shouldn't ask. Uh, but, you know, they, they take seminars and that's okay. I don't say anything in this room I wouldn't say in front of a tenant. I mean, there, there's no secrets. Everything is on the table. Uh, I just, and I, I hope they like their houses, respect their houses, take good care of their houses, pay on time, and there's a benefit to them of doing that. They get to live in a nice house, and they get to keep me as a landlord. And having a landlord who is responsive and who is honest and who has kind of a long-term view of things, and not going to sell this house next year, is a real benefit to a tenant, isn't it? Real benefit. So don't underestimate the benefit of you being a good landlord to a tenant. And, and, and you can't sell that very hard, but you can, they'll pick up on that if you'll say the right things. The next page, nine ways to reward long-term tenants that won't break the bank. Now, if you've got people that have been with you for a while, it's okay to lose a negotiation every once in a while. I had some people call me up here a couple years ago and they said, we, we would like to... Uh, paint our house on the inside. We know we've lived in here 10 years and we haven't painted anything on the inside in 10 years. And, and would you mind, uh, would you pay for half the paint if we would do all the painting on the inside? Half the paint. And I said, no, I won't pay for half the paint. They said, you won't? I said, no, I'll pay for all the paint if you'll paint the inside of your house after 10 years. And you can choose any color you want. Because after 10 years, haven't they made me a whole bunch of money? And if they paint the inside of that house, what does that tell me? They want to stay a little bit longer, don't they? They probably won't stay another 10 years. Well, that's pretty good business. That's a good time to be nice and to lose a negotiation. And I've had the same conversation about carpet. People called me up once after about 20 years on carpet and said, you know, we, we, uh, we, we haven't worn this carpet out, but we're kind of tired of the color after 20 years. <laughs> Would you mind if we change the color? And I said, no, you can pick any color you want. And they went out and bought a new color, no carpet. And they, and they bought a kind of, you know, they might have bought better looking carpet than we had in there. <laughs> and they put it down and they stayed there another eight or ten years. Well, that's, that's good business, isn't it? So, you know, you can, you can lose the negotiation sometimes. And I didn't pay for that carpet. They paid for the carpet. They just got to pick the color. That's <laughs> any color you want. I don't care. Uh, have fun. You know, you're buying it. So you can do things. And here's a lot of little things you can do. You know, I don't know about you, but if you come to my house, there's probably something Valerie would like to have done that I haven't done yet. You know, probably on her list. If you give somebody a handyman for a half a day or a day, can they do a lot of things in, in a short period of time? Yeah. yeah, they can fix a lot of little things that are wrong, doorknobs, light switches that aren't working right, replace a bunch of stuff. So this is a great way to reward a tenant. And really, who's, who's benefiting from this in the long run? <laughs> You, it's your house, right? I mean, you're not painting your car, you're painting your house. So if you go out there and, and fix a bunch of stuff on your house, that, it's your but they'll like that. The tenants will like that. So, you know, if they've got drawers that aren't working right or a fan that's not working right, just little stuff like that. Spend a couple hundred bucks on parts, spend, spend a couple hundred bucks to send a guy out there every half a day, and that's good business, and, and, uh, and they'll love you for that. Same thing with the yard man. Uh, pressure cleaning the house can make a big difference. You know, houses do get kind of nasty looking if you haven't painted them in 10 or 15 years. Send a pressure cleaner out there. That only costs a couple hundred bucks, and you can make the house look really nice. 
Uh, plant a tree or trim a tree or improve the landscaping. Again, if you, if you have people that owe you money and can't pay you, and, and I had a lot of this over the last five years. I had a number of people in the trades who, some of them were tenants, they owed me money and they couldn't pay me. I traded out. You know, I had people doing yard work, and I had people doing tree work, and I had people doing painting work, and I had people doing pressure cleaning work. So uh, you, if you go back and look at my rental application, it does ask on there, what skills do you have? And uh, some people have skills. You know, they can, do, they can do jobs. So you can use these people. Furnish them paint to repaint. Have, pay to have carpets cleaned. I, I had a guy call me up not long ago. He wanted, he wanted new carpets. And I said, uh, you know, I won't pay for new carpets unless we raise your rent. Now, if you don't mind me raising the rent, I'll put new carpets in your house. He said, no, I don't want to do that. And I said, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll pay to clean your carpets. He said, well, that'd be great. So I paid my carpet cleaner to go out there and clean his carpets. That doesn't cost much. That doesn't cost much. And he's happy. His wife's happy. Everybody's happy now. That's a lot cheaper than new carpets, isn't it? So uh, little things like that uh, work. Clean the screens and windows. Nobody likes that job. But that's a good job. To, you know, if somebody owes you some money and they want to work it off, that's a good job for somebody. Clean up and tune the AC or furnace. Uh, you know, that, that, that'll save you some money in the long run, but it'll save them some money immediately. You know, you have a, an AC guy do a service on their unit the first part of the year. That'll make them happy. And new mailbox and house numbers. That's a little thing, but think about what houses you have that have nasty-looking mailboxes. Anybody got a bad-looking mailbox in front of a house? You know, that's a cheap thing to fix, isn't it? But it kind of gives them pride of ownership. because It's a little thing to do that dresses that house up. So, so think about doing that. Responding to emergencies on the next page. If you think through what an emergency really is, and how you want to respond to it before it happens. It, it'll help you not become emotional when it happens. It'll help you uh, respond in a business-like way and make a good decision here. And uh, it'll probably help keep your tenant calmer because tenants are the ones that are getting excited now, not you. So you want to prepare tenants for emergencies before they happen and talk about what an emergency is when you interview with them and furnish them with a document like the following page. And we'll get to it in just a second here. Real emergencies should be handled as soon as you learn about them. Uh, if you have a real excited tenant with a relatively minor problem, you want to let them cool off a little bit before you call them back. You don't want to respond like in 30 seconds, give them 15, 20 minutes or an hour, give them a call back. Have them leave you a message and form a plan before calling them back. I just talked about that. Have, have, have your AC guy on call if that's what it takes. Some examples of some emergencies and non-emergencies here. Real emergencies, you want to, you want to respond as quickly as you can here. Uh, smoke. Sparking or shocking electrical outlets, leaking water, ruptured hot water tank, broken water line, leaking roof, collapsing ceiling, uh, trees falling on the house, electrical failure, tree and damage in danger of falling on the house. Those are real emergencies, right? Somebody could get hurt, property could get damaged, and if you don't respond to these type of things pretty quickly and somebody gets hurt, you might have some liability. So that's why important, it's important that you have some kind of feedback mechanism and uh, when Valerie and I both leave town for a couple weeks, which we do on a regular basis, last year we were in, in uh, Australia for two weeks, and we were in Europe for two weeks, you know, we have somebody local that will check on our emergency line just to see what's going on. You know, if there is an emergency, we'll try to respond within a day or two to it. Uh, so, so we're not negligent. So we're not proven to be negligent or something like that. Some important issues that are, that are not real emergencies down at the bottom no, no, I don't have any employees. So it's a friend. It's somebody just like you. Somebody just like you who's a landlord, who's in the business, who will look after my stuff while I'm out of town, and I'll look after their stuff while they're out, they're out of town. That's, that's one reason I'm subletting my apartment to a good friend, not my apartment, my uh, office to a good friend of mine who's also a landlord, is because if I'm out of town and he's not, he'll, he'll notice my phone ringing, right? Uh, and vice versa. You know, if he leaves town for two weeks, I can look after his stuff. So that, it's a pretty good situation if you can kind of have somebody you can work with back and forth like that. No heat or air conditioning. It's not a life-threatening thing, typically. If it is, you want to deal with it faster. But anybody here ever live without uh, air conditioning? Yeah. Yeah. A lot of us did. Yeah. A lot of us, some of us still do, right? Uh, no hot water. You know, you can live without hot water. Mold, termites, etc. Now, these things are important. You want to take care of them, but they're not emergencies. They're not going to kill anybody overnight. Uh, so you want to deal with them as quickly as possible. You're not required to perform miracles. You're required to respond reasonably and do what a reasonable person would do. So you get in front of a judge, that's going to be the standard you're held to. Did you respond reasonably and do what a reasonable person would do? A lot of times, when, when, if I get a tenant on the phone, 
I'm going to let them do most of the talking. Because if you'll let them do a lot of talking, sometimes they'll come up with a solution to their own problem. You know, I've had people talk, complain about, complain, 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 complain. I just listen, listen, and before the end, they say, man, I've got a guy who can fix all that stuff. I said, okay. <laughs> you know, I, I'd rather have them supervising the fixing than me supervising the fixing, because if their guy doesn't do it right, who are they going to chew on? Their guy, not me, right? If I send somebody out there and it doesn't get it right, they're going to chew on me. So getting them involved in a process of solving a problem is an important part of having them self-manage, and, and uh, keep in mind. Look on the next page, you'll see this emergency procedures and phone numbers list. And uh, I've, I've taken my people's name and numbers off of there. You have to plug your own name and numbers down to the bottom of that list. Oh, and one other thing, when we went over the rental contract, you will notice that it had send the money to, and it had my address in there. You may want to change that line if you're going to just Xerox that rental contract. <laughs> I've had people Xerox it, and I get checks from all over the country, you know, uh, and people don't know why they're sending checks to Sarasota, Florida, and the house is in Illinois, but it worked, you know, it, 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 they'll get that, they'll deliver them down here, uh, so, so, so it's okay to Xerox stuff, but uh, you might want to cross that part out. So emergency procedures and phone numbers here, um, we, we say in the top paragraph that we, we hope that you never have one, but if you have an emergency, here's the procedures we'd like you to follow, okay? And we say, put your safety and the safety of your family ahead of the property. Don't, don't worry about the property. So we write this in case a judge gets to read it. Um, and it says that if uh, you have a water leak or a broken pipe, you can't shut off or roof damage you're causing a leak or an electrical problem, creates a dangerous situation. And during business hours, you can call these numbers or send us an email now. We've got email on all our stuff. Uh, and if that doesn't work, here's an, a list of people you can call. And down to the bottom, if you jump right down to the bottom, suggested service providers. What I do is I put a plumber's name and number under the clog pipe. I put a, you know, so I, I, I list the people that we like to use on those, uh, in, in every category here. Uh, so they can get things fixed without me. If I'm in Europe for two weeks and they can't get a hold of anybody and they've got a leaking pipe, I don't want it to leak for two weeks. I want them to fix it before I get back. So I'm going to be smart enough to call these people, and if the plumber charges me 200 bucks and I normally would have paid 150 bucks, that's the breaks, isn't it? That, that's the cost of being out of town. Uh, so, but it, it's not—it's probably not going to cost me much. I mean, the guy's not going to overcharge me because he wants to keep doing business with me. You know, it's not like I called him from Europe and it's a one-time thing. He does all my work, so he's going to take care of me. At the back up at the top, you know, if you called your doctor's office, anybody called your doctor's office in the last couple of years? It said, if it's an emergency, what do they tell you to do? Nine Call 911. Well, that's what this is. And that's where I got this. It's from my doctor's office. It said, if it's an emergency, call 911. Don't call me. I don't do emergencies, right? So if it's a fire or a burglary, if the neighbors are giving you a hard time, uh, if, uh, call 911. If the water and sewer is not working, call the utility company. You know, I don't run that either. Uh, and only after you're safe should you attempt to call our office. Okay? So if your house is on fire, get out of the house before you call us. Electrical problems, and then I go on here, it says don't, you know, just common sense stuff, but don't use it if it's not working, if it's hot or sparking, don't use it. Turn off the electricity, uh, immediately discontinue use, and call our office for assistance. Water leaks, in, in an event your hot water heater is leaking or another pipe is leaking, shut off the water supply. Now one thing you can do, is you should know where the shut off valve is on your houses, good idea. And you should show your tenants where the shut off valve is, and if you don't have a shut off valve, put one in, you're supposed to have one. Uh, so somebody can go turn the water off if a water pipe leaks, because that's not an uncommon occurrence. Water pipes do leak occasionally. So, so do that. That'll save you some money down the road. Uh, but it says here if the, if the hot water heater is just not making the water hot enough, that's not an emergency. We'll get to that during the next business day. But if the hot water heater is leaking and there's water every place, turn off the water, give us a call. We'll get it fixed as fast as we can. And then clogged drain lines. It goes on to say, those are not our problem. These are your problems. You can call a plumber, you can call anybody you want, but you get to pay the bill on a clogged drain line. And then at the bottom, we put in the numbers, okay? Any questions on that? Give, people like getting a list of names and numbers they can call when you, when you can't be reached. Now, if they call them directly, they're still responsible for the first 100 bucks, and that's okay. If it's a really an emergency, the 100 bucks is not a big issue, is it? I mean, if the roof is really leaking, if the water pipe's really leaking, you just want to solve that immediately, because it can do a lot more than $100 for the damage. On the next page, responding positively to the 10 terrifying tenant phone calls. 
Number one is broken. Somebody calls and said it's broken, I always ask how to break. You know, things hardly ever break all by themselves. I mean, every once in a while someone will just fall off, but it doesn't happen too often, does it? Generally, it's broken because uh, somebody's been mishandling it. And uh, once we get through that, I, I say, can you fix it? You know, if it's something little and it's appropriate for them to fix it, I want to ask them if they can fix it. Now, do you know anybody who can't fix anything at all? Yeah. You don't want them fixing stuff. <laughs> if, if they have no idea which way to turn a screw to tighten it, you don't want them messing with stuff because they're just going to make it worse, aren't they? So you have to know who you're talking about, too. But if they can't fix it, uh, clarify whose responsibility it is. You know, if they're responsible for the first hundred bucks, let's talk about that. And then let's talk about how we're going to solve the problem. And if they know somebody who can solve the problem, maybe that's a good solution. But I don't want my tenants calling their AC guy, who's a cousin or somebody they met in a bar last night. That's never going to work out. I really want to use my repair people to do almost any serious repair. But if it's landscaping, if it's something small, I'm, I'm going to let them use their guy. Number two, I'm broke. First thing you want to ask is, and first thing you want to really determine is this a temporary condition or a permanent condition, you know? Uh, if, if they're just temporarily broke and they've been a good tenant and they've been with you for a couple of years and you think they might be redeemable, then you, want to, you might want to work with them. So if they're temporarily broke and they just can't pay you right now, I always ask, how much can you pay? Okay? How much money do you have? I don't care if they just bring in 200 bucks. If they show me some good faith up front, now if they owe me a thousand bucks and just bring in 200 bucks, that's not much good faith. But a lot of times, people who owe you a thousand bucks will bring in 500 bucks. You know, they'll have a chunk of it. They're just a little bit short. And uh, so if somebody will bring in 500 bucks today, and they're bringing another 500 bucks next Friday, and they maybe still owe me a hundred bucks, bring the balance in the next week, you know, I would work with a good tenant like that, wouldn't you? I'd work with a good tenant like that. Now, if they're not a good tenant, if these are people, and I kind of have a list of my tenants from the ones I like the most up here to the ones I like the least down here, if they're at the bottom of my list, the least like tenants, I might be a little tougher on them because I've got them between a rock and a hard spot now. If they can't pay the rent, I can move them out of that house if I want to. So it's your call whether or not you want to work with them or just move them out. If you decide that they're, they're, this is not a temporary problem, it's a permanent problem, in your mind you think they're not going to recover from this. And the guy's lost his job, his wife left him, and the dog died all the same day. He's, got a, he's having a bad, bad week, and nothing's good going to happen here in the next couple of weeks. You're better off moving him out right now, this afternoon, tomorrow. You know, give him some money to get him out of the house, because right now you have the most money of his you're ever going to have. Right? You've got a, a chunk of change. You've got the security deposit right now, but it's disappearing at the rate of a rent. If it's 50 bucks a day or whatever it is, that's disappearing on you right now. And so the sooner you can get them out of there, the better off you are. And so it's much better to offer to buy out somebody who's got a terminal problem than to pray for them and hope they're going to get better. Because that's not going to happen very often on a tenant. You know, you're better off getting them into it. And what do they need if they're broke? They need moving money. They need the money to, to either maybe rent a truck to go someplace else or to move in with a buddy or move in with their parents or something. But they need a way to move their stuff out of the house and get someplace else. So see if you can't do that. My check's going to bounce. Okay? And I told you already that my response <coughs> to that is, you know, if you bring the cash in right now or a money order right now, no new checks. Here's a mistake. Don't take a new check. <laughs> if the old check is no good, the new check's just going to be pretty. It's not going to be good either, right? But it's funny because Tennis said, well, I'll bring another check right down. I said, well, that doesn't do me any good. You, know, you don't have any money in your account. That's why the first one bounced. The only thing that will do me any good is real money, cash. But if you bring the cash down right now, I'll be a good guy. And we won't charge you the loss discount. We'll just charge you the $50 bad check fee. But it has to come in right now. And, and, and you know, by, by giving them something, by letting them save that $100 uh, discount, that, that it motivates them to do something in a hurry. Because you don't want this to drag out for a week. That, that's a, this is a big problem. We are splitting up in my ex sustain. Now, let me, let me hear from you how that works out most of the time. Making all the money, it's, well, good. it's generally the one making all the money that's leaving. You know, that, that's the problem. And, and, the one, and, and it's generally it's the, the woman who leaves because she's making all the money and she leaves a deadbeat husband behind. And what does he do directly after that? 
Moves, moves in, well, moves in three or four of his friends generally the next weekend, you know, and they have a party, and then they all find girlfriends, right? But they're all a bunch of, a bunch of deadbeats. So, so this is a bad situation. And as soon as you're, you're on to this, you, uh, you want to do a couple things. Uh, first of all, you want to try to get them all out of the house because if you don't want to rent, the, if you have the weak part of this team left, you don't want to rent to them probably because you wouldn't rent to them to start with, right? So I asked the question, would I rent to these people if they applied now? If the answer is no, you want to get them out of the house. Uh, if they can't move out of the house, I mean, as a fallback position, you might try to get a co-signer. You might see if the parents would co-sign or somebody else would put up some money for them. But because these people don't make enough money by themselves to afford the house, just admit to yourself, this is going to go downhill and you're going to have to get rid of them at some point. And again, because you have a bunch of their money right now, you're better off making some kind of deal to get them out sooner rather than let this drag out for a couple months. The biggest mistake you can make is let somebody get two or three months behind on you because you'll never get that money back. You'll never get that money back. And it just drag. Now you got to drag out. You have to go through a full eviction process and it'll drag out and turn into being a three or four or five month deal. Well, that, that's a disaster, isn't it? I mean, that's a big, that's a $5,000 mistake you just made. So when you find out that somebody's ex has moved out or you've only got half the team left and, and you analyze half the team, you should have an application on this half. You see what kind of work they do and ask them questions. You know, maybe they, maybe you've got the strong half left. Maybe you've got the, uh, the income earner left and it'll work out. You decide to keep them. But if you decide to get rid of them, move, move aggressively. Next one says, we're leaving. Now, we're leaving is not all bad news, depending on who they are. But if they're leaving early, they've only been there six months and they're leaving, explain to them they're going to lose their security deposit unless what good can happen here? What can they do for you that would be good to help them get their security deposit back? They can help you find the next tenant, right? Well, this is a good situation because if they're hard selling the next tenant and telling them what a good guy you are and what a nice neighborhood this is and what a great house this is, they're a pretty good salesperson. And they have incentive to do this because they want their deposit back. So them moving out is not, not really bad news as long as you handle it right and, and get them on your team to find yourself a new tenant. Uh, we're not leaving, but we can't pay. Well, you can go back to some maybe a weekly payment. If I can't talk them out of a little bit of money, uh, I see this as a terminal situation. If you call me up and say, we can't pay you a dime, that's real bad, right? I mean, I can, I can take a couple hundred bucks, 500 bucks, but if you can't give me any money at all, uh, something bad has happened here. You've lost your job. You spent all your money doing something else. Unless you can give me something, the equivalent of cash, maybe you've got a car you give me or a trailer you give me or something else, you know, I look at it, but typically you're going to move them out. Yes, sir. Oh yeah. Well, it's negotiable, isn't it? It's negotiable. But my point is you have their entire deposit to work with at that point. So if they gave you a $1,500 deposit, you can use up to $1,500 without writing a check out of your pocket. So far, that's their money. And if they would move out of that house and leave it clean, you don't have to use it all, but it, you know, you, it, it probably going to take them a chunk of it to get them out of that house. Not $100, bucks, but probably $500, bucks, maybe $1,000, and maybe $1,500. Oh, yeah. You can keep it. Well, you can demand, but demand and getting are two different things. Okay. But they, you know, they, they, they don't have, uh, I mean, you could try to sue them. I mean, the only way you actually can get money from somebody is sue them, get a judgment, then attach something. But a tenant who's behind on a rent probably doesn't have a lot of assets, right? So the chances of you attaching something are pretty slim. But why you have that 1500 bucks, you don't have to give the whole $1,500 back to get them out. It's a negotiable thing. And, and I'll tell you, mentally, they've pretty much written off that 1500 bucks. They don't think they're going to get it back at this point. So any money you give them is, is pretty much a gift. So, so you don't, don't start at 1500 bucks. You might start at 750 and, and maybe give them 1000 or something. I've got mold or the current problem. I always ask, when did you first notice it? We, we had a lady who called and says, the inside of my closet is all black. I said, Really? When did you first notice that? They said, well, she's been, been like that for several months. <laughs> you know, I said, well, something's probably causing that. And we went out and looked and she had a you know, leaking pipe in her, in her uh, bathroom that was leaking through the closet wall and the carpet in the closet was wet. And of course, there's mold growing inside on the closet wall. Our clothes are black. I said, you know, if you had called me when you first noticed it, it wouldn't be a bigger problem. So she ended up paying for part of the repairs because she didn't report it on time. Uh, we ended up paying for part of the repairs. She's a long-term tenant. Been with us 18 years, so I'm not going to throw the lady out. Uh, but people are, are bad 
you know, to, to complain about things generally Friday night at 8 o'clock. You know, they hardly ever call during business hours. That's when they discover everything's wrong. Uh, and it's been wrong for a while. You know, I don't know why it, Friday night at 8 o'clock is a special time, but that seems the time they call. And uh, so we respond on Monday. But, you know, we send people out, solve the problem. Where are the police? There's a problem at the house. Anybody have a problem with the police called you? Police will call occasionally, depending on your tenants. But we've had all sorts of interesting things. And it generally has something to do with drugs. You know, and like I said, the lily white people, that would have been a bit of a police problem. But, uh, you know, other than a bunch of telephone wires, there wasn't any damage done to the place. Uh, but, you know, when there's, when there's drugs involved, the police should get involved. You want the police involved. You don't want to get involved, right? You want the police to take care of this. And uh, we've had instances where the police arrested people and they kicked down the front door to arrest people. But generally, the tenants want to live there. You know, I had a tenant, uh, we got a call on a Friday night one night and said, the, you know, the cops kicked down the front door, they arrested your, your, your tenant. And by the time I got out there Monday to see what would happen, they'd already fixed the front door, bailed out. You know, he, he, it wasn't new to him. He'd, uh, been a drug, he'd been a druggie before, I guess. And, uh, but he wanted to stay in the house. He liked the house. And, uh, and I liked him. He paid on time, paid in cash. I didn't have any problems. And so everything, <laughs> everything went on. You know. Yes, sir. You have somebody who's been there five or six years and the kitchen faucet's shot. Do you ever just do it because you know they're a good tenant and not charging 100 bucks? Or is that... Well, you know, what you can do if you want to reward somebody who's been there five or six years is you send them to handyman for a couple hours and have them go out and fix two or three things and, and tell them to buy new parts and, and hope the house is close to Home Depot so it doesn't have to drive too far to buy all that stuff. You know? uh, but it, that, that's a good idea. You know, just do it for free. It, it's, uh, it's okay to lose negotiations with a tenant who's been there for a while. You know, be, be nice. You don't want to set a precedent, though. And if somebody can't pay you to rent and needs a reduction in rent, we had a couple people that we reduced the rent for because they were good tenants, but they just had an adjustment in their income here back in you know, the last couple of years. And, but we, we make it a temporary reduction in rent, okay? Because if you, if you make it permanent, or if you just say, okay, you can start paying 900 instead of 1,000, they'll pay 900 for the rest of their life, won't they? So what you can do if somebody's having a problem, you say, okay, instead of 1,000, we'll let you pay 900 for, for the next three months. And then we'll go to 950 for the next three months, then we'll go back to 1,000 and write that down. That kind of gets them back up to speed again. But it's a good thing on your part. You helped them out. They, they survived. They're still with you. That, that's a good thing. So let me, I have another question very quickly. You know, I, I'm the one who does the leasing. So I'm, I'm always very conscious about giving one tenant something that another doesn't have. You know, should, what do you mean by that? Well, like you say, you, so suppose another tenant says, well, you know, you reduced her rent. How, how would the other tenant know that? Well, we have a couple duplexes. Ah, we have duplexes. Okay, okay. The rest of the story, as they say. So if you've got an apartment building or duplexes or something where the tenants talk to each other, now you have to be a little sensitive to that because if you lower the rent on one unit, there's a fair chance that they'll talk to the neighbors and say, you can get them for 100 bucks a month now, because we just did, you know? Yeah, and, and it gets twice as expensive. It gets twice as expensive. So you just have to, I mean, I don't have the, the answer to that, but you, if, if you're ever going to do that, you have to swear them to secrecy. Say, look. I'll give you a 50 bucks a month off for the next three months, but if you tell the next door neighbor about it, the deal's off. So that's not a fair housing issue then? I don't think so. Yeah. Okay. I don't think so. I don't okay. think so. Thank you. Yep. Uh, we just had an issue that we have an attorney that owns a house next door to one of our houses, and, and uh, the guy we rented to has a dog, and the dog barks, and the dog barking bothers the tenant next door, and the tenant's not going to leave. So the attorney called me up and said, I'm going to sue you unless you get rid of the dog. I said, really? I said, what, what's that got to do with anything? He said, well, the dog barks, makes my tenant nervous, tenant's going to leave because your dog barks. I said, well, we'll see what we can do about this. So I, I get a hold of my tenant and said, the dog's barking, we've got to stop that. And he said, well, okay, we'll bring the dogs inside, dog won't bark anymore. And then uh, the attorney said, I've called animal control and all this, so I called animal control. You know, if, if somebody starts saying, we called the cops, we called animal control, we called such and such agency, Call them yourself. Follow up. Say, what did they say when you call? Well, the animal control guys are real nice. He said, people do this all the time. You know, they, they can't go to sleep. The dog's barking. They call us. It, it's not a big deal. You know, they're, they're pretty nice down there. So it's not like they're about to throw us out or anything. Uh, but I write a real nice letter to the attorney uh, saying that we called animal control, took care of it, talked to the tenant, could took care of it. You know, if you have any other problems, call me back. And he'd gone away. You know, it was months and months and months ago now. So it probably is solved. The point is, when you have a problem like that, you respond to it as quickly as you can. Okay? Don't let a problem get out of hand. Respond to it. Because that gives the, the landlord on the other side, if the landlord's complaining, something he can take to his tenant and say, look, we, the problem's solved. You know, let us know if there's anything 
else we can do, and, and the problem goes away. Now, we've had some more serious problems. We've had problems where, where dogs look like you're going to eat somebody, you know, and, and we've had to make the dogs go away. So we called the tenant up and said, the dog's not on a lease, not supposed to eat people, got to make the dog go away or move out. And, and they generally make the dog go away. It's interesting that the people who are in love with these dogs can make them go away the same day. I don't know where they take them, but they, I guess they go to live with somebody else, one of, some other relative probably. Uh, well, yeah, they, do, they do something with them, but they're not there anymore. But, but the point is solve the problem. When you have a problem that's potential liability, don't let it become a bigger problem. Jump on it right away, solve the problem, uh, take appropriate response. Next page, raising rents reasonably and regularly. First of all, know your market before you raise your rent. Know what's going on in your market. If the rent's tight, if it's going up, then you should raise your rents fairly aggressively. We like to average 5% a year over the long run. That means every 20 years we double our rent, round figures, uh, really a little less than that. But, but that keeps us kind of in par with everybody else. And there's, there's some years where we don't raise our rents much at all. In fact, when we had seven people not paying the rent back in 09, we didn't raise anybody's rent that month, I guarantee you. But normally, we're raising one or two or three tenants' rent every month because that's about the number of houses we have. And by doing that, we're constantly in touch with the rental market. So if I raise three rents this month and all three of them move out, what am I going to do next month? Not raise anybody's rent, right? We'll be quiet for a while until we get those three rented back up. But if I raise three rents this month, and let's say I raise them all 50 bucks a month, and everybody stays, next month what am I going to do? Oh, I might go to 60 bucks next month and see how it works. Then I might go to 70 bucks and see how it works. And down the road a bit, I might be raising rents $100 a month, right? You kind of, you kind of play the market and see what's going on. So if you only have a couple houses, you don't, you don't get as much feedback as I do. But you should not let somebody stay in a house at the same rent for 5 or 10 years. That you're giving too much money away. You should raise the rents on a regular basis. Okay? Uh, in a flat or decline market, you raise rents the same or even reduce rents temporarily. And again, that temporarily is a, is a, that's a very important concept. Make sure you get that. Don't ever just drop somebody's rent 100 bucks a month. Drop it 100 bucks a month for six months or three months, you know, a short period of time, and then let it go back up again. Do that in writing, document it. That way you, you won't lose your good tenant. You're helping them out, but they, they know that six months from now the rent's going back up, and they'll figure that out. They'll make it work out. In a normal market, 5% average increase. If it's, if it's stronger than normal, you know, every once in a while you get a really hot rental market, you might be able to raise your rents 10 or 20% in one year. Things may really be jumping. So try to stay on top of it. Raise them at least one, of the, you know, one house at a time to test the market. You know, don't, don't, if you only have four houses, don't raise all four of them the same month. Spread them out a little bit. Uh, raise them at least once a year, and once a year will do it. Know the time of year when your rental market's the strongest. In your town, when's the best time to raise rents? When's the best time to rent a house? And uh, hopefully you sync those up. And if you raise your rents during the strongest part of the rental cycle, people probably won't move, will they? It's going to be hard for them to find another house. Everything's going to be pretty expensive. Um, you can reward good tenants with smaller increases and conversely raise your rents on tenants that require a lot of attention. Uh, you know, a tenant that's, that's, that's costing you money in maintenance, a tenant that costs you a lot of time because they call you all the time, uh, you know, it, it's just a natural reaction, I think, to raise the rents a little bit more. Communicate your rent raise to the tenant with a letter. And I'll show you the letter on the next page, but give them more than one month's notice. Uh, tenant, a really good tenant, will start getting nervous a couple months before their lease expires. What are they worried about? They're worried about you may not renew their rent. They may not be able to rent this house for another year. So because of that, you don't want them to go, and if they start thinking that way, what might they do? They might start looking for another house. You don't want them to look for another house, do you? You want them to stay right where they are if they're a good tenant. So at least a month ahead of time, and I say about a month and a half ahead of time is good lead time, send them a letter, and the letter you see that I send is on the next page. It says, you've been a good and faithful tenant, and I appreciate the care you've taken care of the home. Your current rent's 1100 bucks a month. Uh, our costs have gone up, specifically taxes and insurance. I'm willing to renew your rent for another year, to the beginning June 1, 2012, with the rent of 1,075 a month. When you pay on time and have no maintenance calls that month, so you know we, we sync this up with the uh, rental contract. 
you can see if you compare the other houses for rent, still a good deal, still below market, to renew. Sign and return this to our office within 10 days. Now, how far ahead of time do I send this? 45 days. 45 days. It's dated April 17th. It's for a, a June 30th renewal. So it's 45 days out, or June 1st renewal, I'm sorry. And uh, I, so I want them to, to, to commit to this before they start looking around for another house. That's the whole idea. Okay? So I give them 10 days to send this back. Now, they don't have to send it back in 10 days by law or anything, but I'm just asking them to send it back in 10 days. So I'm asking them to make a commitment. And it goes on to say, if you don't send it back within 10 days, we'll begin marketing the house for rent. Well, they don't want that. They don't want for rent sign in their front yard. They don't want me showing their house. So th this puts a little bit of subtle pressure on them to go ahead and renew. It's the path of least resistance, isn't it, to sign this letter and send it back. So we make it really easy. We send them this letter, two copies of it, with a self-addressed stamped envelope back to me. So the easiest thing they can do is sign this thing, put it in that envelope, put it back in the mail, and they're done for another year. Pretty easy, right? A lot easier than moving. Yes, sir? Do you really go put a for rent sign in the yard for a good tenant who doesn't get it back in 10 days? Yeah, probably not, unless I don't like you. If it's a good tenant, I probably wouldn't do that. If it's a good tenant, I might call them. The, the message here, send it in writing, send it early, make it easy for them. Now, I'm raising these people's rent $75 a month. That's a chunk. Okay, how much is that a year? 900 bucks. What do you think it costs them to move out of this house into another house? Pick it up and set it down. How many people here would move if I give you 900 bucks? Pack up all your stuff, move into another house, paint it up. I don't think so. Not many people are going, not, you know, not many people who are busy with jobs in life are going to move for 900 bucks. Okay, now somebody's desperate might do it, but, but if it's desperate, you're going to lose them anyway, right? You don't want them. So I don't think you'll lose many good people for that, that amount of money. Questions on raising rents. Raise them regularly. Uh, that, that way people won't get way behind. You don't want somebody to get two or 300 bucks a month behind. It's costing you too much money and, and the shock will kill them. You know, you raise somebody's rent 200 bucks a month, even the good people will move. You don't, you don't lose your good people. Contracting for repairs with tenants and others. Rules about having tenants make repairs here. Number one, have the bid the work bid by an outside contractor so they know it's going to cost. It's foolish to have a tenant make repairs in your house if they're going to charge you more than a real guy would, right? You don't pay a tenant $2,000 to paint a house. You can have painted for 1000 bucks with a real painter. that are probably not going to do as good a job to start with. So, so use common sense here. The only way you're going to come out ahead if you have a tenant do any kind of repair work is, number one, if they really have the skills. You might have a skilled tenant. But number two, if they'll do it cheaper. Now, the third thing that might work in your favor is you might be able to finance it. You know, if a tenant is going to paint the outside of a house, and let's say it's 1200 bucks to paint the outside of a house, and you can agree to pay that tenant 100 bucks a month for the next 12 months rather than take it all off of one month's rent, well, now you're financing the paint job in effect, aren't you? You spread it out over 12 months. The danger here is if you, if you knock $100 a month off the rent for 12 months, what will they pay in the 13th month? The same low rent. They won't raise it back up. So you have to do some bookkeeping here, and you'd want to document that. You'll see a piece of paper here in a second, but you want to give them a receipt that says you've done this work, you've got a rental credit for this amount, and you can spread it over these months, you know, six months, a year, whatever you want to spread it over. And, uh, and that helps both of you, maybe. So if you have a tenant that has skills, that is a painter or, or can do something for you that improves the house, uh, use them. But be, be very cautious about this, because most of the time it's cheaper to hire somebody else because when you hire somebody else to do the work, you can negotiate the price and get a better deal. Agree on how much credit the tenant will receive for doing the work. Specify carefully in writing what works to be done and to what standards, especially like painting the outside of a house. You know, the prep work is very important when you do something like that. And if somebody doesn't know how to paint a house, that would be a mistake to let them do it. Give the credit only after work is completed and inspected. I had a guy move into a house once that was a plumber, and it needed some plumbing work done. So I wrote down what needed to be done. He said, okay, I'll take care of it. And we adjusted his rent like 50 bucks a month for the next year to take care of it. He moved out of that house two years later, hadn't fixed anything. It was a two-bedroom house, only one bathroom work for two years. And he was a plumber. <laughs> it happens. If tenants pay for the materials, get a receipt, okay, to make sure they really pay for the materials. If a tenant hires work done, get a receipt to make sure he paid the guy he did, who did the work. Never have a tenant perform dangerous work unless he's insured and licensed and get a copy of their certificate of insurance if, if it's insured. 
Some work suitable for tennis on the next page. All work takes some skill. It's best to see a sample of their work before you have them paint your whole house, you know. So have them paint something small to see how they paint before you let them do it. But simple things like cleaning, simple carpentry repairs, like maybe like a fence repair, yard work, minor plumbing repairs, wallpaper, even replacing floor tiles. You know, you don't have to be a genius to do that, but you need to know what you're doing and, and do, it, do it so it looks right when you're done. All these things can improve your house and, and are suitable for some tenant work. Stuff down to the bottom, major plumbing, roofing, wiring, tree trimming. Don't let your tenants do any of that stuff. You don't want a tenant to get hurt and then uh, come back and make some kind of claim against you, do you? So don't let them do anything that looks dangerous. You'll see a release of liability form, which you can get them to sign, uh, but it probably is something a lawyer would just laugh at if something serious happened. So make sure you, you have insurance on your houses. Uh, and insurance should give you both protection in case the house burns down or blows away, of course, and liability protection. Now, some people don't carry any insurance on a house itself. They just carry liability protection, and that's fine. But make sure you have liability protection because some people think they're uh, judgment-proof. But the problem with being judgment-proof is if you don't defend yourself in a lawsuit and they do get a judgment against you, how long is that judgment good for? Long, well, you can renew it, though, can't you? You can renew it. So it can last for a very long time. So if somebody sued you for 500,000 bucks and got a judgment against you for $500,000, what's the first thing that'll probably happen to that judgment? It'll get sold to somebody. There are people that'll buy those judgments and they'll buy them cheap. But then what, who are you dealing with? Who, who bought that judgment cheap, do you think? A professional It'll be a lawyer. It'll be a lawyer. A lawyer would buy that cheap because there are a bunch of law firms and that's all they do is buy judgments and discounts. And now you've got a new friend Okay? And, and that new friend will keep an eye on you, and if you ever slip up and have a bank account or anything they can grab, they'll grab it, right? Because they may have paid like 10000 bucks for that $500,000 judgment, and they're, they're going to try to collect as much as they can off of it. So it's just not good strategy. Liability insurance is really prepaid legal services. If you get sued for a half a million bucks and you have a $3 million liability policy, the insurance company is going to hire the lawyer and represent you and try to beat them out of that judgment. And that half million dollar judgment may get beat down to 50 grand or 100 grand and they may pay it. But that's a lot cheaper than, than going the other way. So have liability insurance. Uh, notice of maintenance performed and loss of discount on the next page. This is the letter we send our tenants when we do work on their house. And it says we've done work. Next month you have to pay the discount. You lose 100 bucks. If it weren't getting done right, let us know, and we'll send a guy back out there. So, so look at that. The next page, talk about returning deposits. Read your landlord and tenant law specifically with regards to how you're supposed to give these deposits back and really understand that part because you have certain notice periods. And if you don't give notice within a certain period, you generally lose your rights to make any claim on that security deposit. And that's a very bad day. When you send that deposit back, if you make a claim against it, this settlement statement you see here is uh, what we use in, in our town. You may have to modify it if you're in a different state, uh, but that's okay. Re recite your statute in there. Use the appropriate language. But here's the key. Whenever you make a claim against somebody's security deposit, make sure you send the receipts of the money you spent with the claim. Don't do the work yourself. Don't go out there and clean the carpet yourself and paint it yourself and mow the grass yourself. Hire people to do that work. Where are you going to get the money to pay them? Out of the security deposit. You've got cash, right? You've got a $1,500 security deposit. If you have to do $600 worth of repairs, do the repairs, write the checks, pay them, get the receipts and attach the receipts to the form you send them, now you won't have an argument, okay? It proves you did the work. Where you get in trouble with tenants is where you do all the work yourself, and then you deduct a thousand bucks from their security deposit for all that work you did, and they argue, well, it wasn't a thousand bucks worth of work. There's only 300 bucks worth of work, and now they get in front of a law, joy or a judge that has to make a decision. So hire somebody else to do it, get the receipts, you won't have that issue. Getting rid of tenants on the next page. There'll be a time in your life where you need to get rid of somebody, okay? And you've got some choices. Down at the bottom, you can raise the rent. Sometimes that'll move them out. You can buy them out. Just write them a check and say, I'll give you this much money if you'll move out, but you've got to move out by this weekend, and I won't give you the money until you're totally out of the house. Don't make a mistake giving them the money first. Give it to them when they get out of the house. You can help them move. 
you know, rent them a moving truck, rent them one of those pods, rent something that, that helps them get their stuff out of the house. You can pay people to move their furniture out of the house. I mean, you can provide the labor, but be creative. Getting people out of your house sometimes is, is, is a smart thing to do. Eviction is the absolute last choice. And why is that? Cost money. Cost money. And how much time does it take? It takes lots of time. Take a month or two to get rid of somebody through an eviction process, okay? And that's not a sure thing. You can go two months and get in front of a judge, and the judge might say, no, you can't evict them. Well, now you got another problem, don't you? You have to start all over again. So uh, going in front of a judge is, should always be your last choice. You just don't know what's going to happen when you get there. If you can write a check and buy somebody out of a bad situation, that's far, far cheaper because now what do you have back? You have your house back, and you can rent it to somebody else and start producing income again. So again, I've said this a couple times, it's a very important point, why you still have their entire security deposit. You know, they're not in big trouble yet. Move quickly, do something to get them out of the house. When all else fails, evict them or adopt them. Valerie wrote a, a, a special report years ago titled Evict them or Adopt them. So I, I stole that from her. Yes, ma'am. What do you do if they don't pay their last month's rent? I, I evict them. Well, I, I do. I start the eviction process. What's the first step in the eviction process? Three Everybody got that one right. So I handed them a three. I hand them a three-day notice. They say, "What's this for?" I said, "Well, you didn't pay the rent." They said, "Well, we've got a last month's rent." And I said, "No, you don't have a last month's rent." Okay. And normally, this gets done over the phone. Normally, I don't even have to do that because sometimes they'll call me up or send me a note and say, "Use my security deposit for the last month's rent." You get that occasionally, and then I get on the phone and call them up and say, "You don't have a last month's rent. You've got a security deposit." If you don't pay the last month's rent, the only choice I have is to start the eviction process. So I'll, I'll give you a three-day notice. If you don't respond to that, I'll, I'll uh, have the sheriff deliver a notice. If you don't respond to that, we'll go to court and we'll get a judgment against you. If you don't respond to that, we'll move you out of the house. It'll consume your entire security deposit. You won't get a dime back. If you pay the last month's rent, because you owe it anyway, right, and you move out on time and give me the house back in good shape, I'll give you all your security deposit back. Which is a better deal for them to get their security deposit back, okay? Because they're going to lose some of that money if they make me go through the eviction process. So you talk to them, you know, you've got to be serious about this. It's not a joke or anything. You've got to be serious about explaining this to them. Uh, but, but you have to be firm. You, know, you can't back off of that. Because if you let them use the security deposit for the last month's rent, you don't have much money left, do you? Now what if they don't move out? What if they stay? They can stay a long time because now you've only got maybe five or 800 bucks of their money, right? So you're in trouble. So you, you have to be tough on that. Stay, stay right on top of that. Yes, sir. In the settlement statement, if they did object in writing, then what's, what happens after that? You well, you, 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 you negotiate. The question Randy has is that with a settlement statement, you send them a settlement statement, they've got to respond in writing. If they don't, if they don't follow the statute, then you've got them. But if they do respond, you know, you could end up in front of a judge. You could end up with a court hearing. I've never done that. I've never gone to court because of a security deposit. Uh, I have negotiated a couple, but not in so long, I can't tell you. It's been 20 years since I negotiated. Because most of the time, you make a claim, it's a very reasonable claim, and they don't object to it. So you're, Now, it, it, they're not going to be happy. You know, sometimes you say, well, if I give them 900 bucks instead of 700 bucks, maybe they'll be happier and go away. I don't think it makes any difference. I think they're unhappy both ways. So just do what's really fair and what you can really document. Okay, don't, don't fudge your numbers in their favor. That's what I tend to think about doing, you know. I don't fudge them in my favor. You know, I don't steal 200 bucks from them. I tend to say, well, I'll give them 200 bucks more. That'll make them happier. That doesn't make them happier. They're not happy anyway, right? So just, just be as straight as you can with it. Use real expenses, deduct it. And, uh, you know, if you have to go to court, you have to go to court. But it's been, I've never been to court, so. Long time since I've been in court. Oh, so, so I go through here on, on the next couple pages just the steps in the eviction process. I hope you never have to evict. Uh, eviction is sort of like a toothache. You know, it's not a good thing. Uh, and if you'll, if you'll do a, the things we've talked about today, as far as selection goes, as far as collecting uh, a large security deposit and giving people a good deal on the rent, uh, being, being uh, careful about who you rent to, getting the information, checking references, talking to people before they move in, spending some time with a rental contract before they move in, you will eliminate almost all the flags. Now, somebody's going to sneak in occasionally, but it, when, when you get somebody who's having problems, financial problems, move as quickly as you can with them. You know, just don't let it drag out. The folks that have the biggest, the worst stories 
or the people who let somebody live in a house for six months or a year and they don't collect any rent and you know you hear these sad stories and they're, they just go comatose you know they don't take action the trick is to take action move as fast as you can keeping track of income and expenses and other details uh, things you don't need to keep track of and do need to keep track of on page 54 here uh, you know you want to know obviously who your tenants are how to get a hold of them if they've got pets you want to keep all this stuff uh, in an organized fashion where you can see it. We set up a file for each house that we buy and we put in that file everything that pertains to that file. So we can go to a house that we've owned for 20 years and look in that file and everything that's ever happened to that house is in that file. It makes it pretty easy to, to go back and sort through things. Now, I haven't been audited in a long time, but if you get audited and you're a landlord and own a bunch of properties, what do you think they're gonna look for? Okay, somebody said depreciation. So you, you, you want to be able to explain the depreciation schedule to somebody. You know, you've got a, 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 a closing statement where you bought a house, you've owned this house this long, you've shown how much depreciation you're taking. Okay, that's one thing. So that, that keep track of Income. Income. You know, if your income isn't steady, if you, if you report eight months rent one year, 10 months rent the next year, seven months rent the next year, what do they think is going on? You're putting money right in your pocket and you're not reporting it, right? So if you repent, report 12 months rent every year, that looks better, doesn't it? So if you stay full, report the rent. If you think you can outsmart the IRS, you're thinking wrong. <laughs> because if, if they want to send the first team down, they're going to catch you. And if you think you can collect rent, put it in your pocket and not report that and get away with it, that's just bad thinking. So, so don't do that. Report your rent. Report all your expenses. And what do you have to do to be able to take this expense? What do you have to document if they show up at your house? Receipts, real receipts. You can't deduct it unless you have a receipt. And that's why it's important to have a file for these houses. And every time you buy something at Home Depot or pay a plumber or whoever you pay, put the receipt in the file. So when they do come out at you, if they ever do, you have all these receipts, okay? Now you file your tax return on in, in, in one of the checklists I have in here for are you in trouble is, do you file your tax returns on time? You should file them on time. That doesn't mean April 15th. It means by the extension period, but you should keep your, you should be current on an annual basis on your tax return. Because if you stay current and you, and you document things well, the chances of them coming to see you drop down. Okay. Now the nice thing about our being a real estate investor, as opposed to investing in a lot of other stuff is they can see your income, they being the IRS, your income and expenses, but what don't they see? They don't see your net worth. They don't see the amount of assets you own. No, if you could have income of $300,000 this year and expenses of $250,000 and you have $50,000 a year in taxable income, all from real estate, what's your net worth? Doesn't show up any place, does it? Doesn't show up on a Schedule E, doesn't show up on your tax return. Now, if you have all your income from tax-free municipal bonds, can they do some math and figure out how much money you have? Mm -hmm. They can. They do, they do a little math backwards to figure out what your net worth is. So you can, my point is, your profile can be lower. You can own a whole bunch of real estate. You could own a whole bunch of land and not have much income, couldn't you? Anybody ever own a whole bunch of land? That's, that's one good way not to have any income. <laughs> If that's your goal, careful how you set goals, you know. Uh, but, you, but my point is, you can have a lower profile. You can have a low profile. We've been audited a bunch, not for a long time. But years we were audited, we had high income, we did a lot of transactions. So I, I modified my behavior to do fewer transactions, okay? Now, the transactions that cause you a lot of attention are not purchase transactions. What are they? No, sale. sale transactions. You know, I go out and buy 10 houses a year. That won't cause any excitement at all. But if I start selling 10 houses a year, that may get somebody's attention because it jumps my income up and then the lights go off. They say, well, if you go see John, you might be able to collect some more money. You know, that's what the computer tells them. So they come down and see me. So you want to keep your, low pro your profile as low as possible. And, and the way to do that is, is to keep good records. Uh, if you ever get audited, if you can't find anything, is that a good strategy? I, I've heard people tell, oh, that's what you do. You just put things in bags, you just bring out a whole bunch of bags and you can't find anything. I said, you know, they, they may send the first team in because they may say, unless you can prove you have these expenses with receipts, you can't deduct them. So now you get to go through all those bags and look for those receipts. You're much better off having an organized system of some kind where you can produce the receipts. And I think the original receipts probably still a good idea, although I'm sure we're going to go be able to scan all this stuff pretty soon and just show them the scan stuff and they'll be happy. Yeah. 
So enough of that. So stuff you want to keep track of. I won't read all this stuff to you. The insurance policy is a big deal, though, isn't it? Because insurance does expire. Uh, I'm on the page that says keeping track of income and expenses and other details. Obviously, you want to keep track of the rent that's coming in and the expenses you paid. And, and I have two lists in my office, and I've always had this. I have a list of all the money that's supposed to come in this month, and I have a list of all the money that's supposed to go out this month, and, and I make sure both things happen. You know, I make sure I collect the rent that I'm supposed to collect. So if I've got 30 rent checks to collect, I want to make sure they all come in. If I've got 10 mortgage payments to make, I want to make sure I make those 10 mortgage payments. And then if I have insurance to pay or pay taxes and all that stuff, you, you just have to stay on top of it. And, and you're, you're really the chief financial officer in your business, right? You're the one that's in charge. If you don't make sure these bills get paid and you don't collect the rent, uh, you know, money just disappears. And it can disappear in big gobs. You know, I've had people go out and buy lots of houses and go broke. Just buying 20 or 30 or 50 or 100 houses doesn't make any money, does it? What do you have to do next? You have to manage them. You have to collect the rent. You have to keep the books. You've got to pay the bills because if you don't do that, things will disappear. You know, if you don't if you don't pay your taxes, you don't pay your insurance, you don't pay your mortgage payments, houses can disappear. Great big gobs of equity can disappear. So if you won't do this, if you can't do this, if you don't have the aptitude for doing this, keeping track of the details, what can you do? Hire, Hire somebody who'll do it for you. Okay? I had a full-time bookkeeper for 25 years, and that's, that's the secret to my survival uh, is somebody else has done the detail work for me all my life because, I, you know, I put it off. Now, I can do it. You know, I, you know it, it does, it's not a, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to uh, balance a checkbook and pay bills and do that, but it's something that has to be done methodically on a regular basis. Just keep, keep after it. So if it's not your personality to keep after it, get somebody else to do it. The next page talks about simple bookkeeping for non-bookkeepers. And, and uh, we've covered some of this, but for tax purposes, you want to, you know, keep, make sure you report the income, keep the receipts, use a Schedule E to report your income and expenses, not a C. E, we mentioned that earlier, like echo, not a C. Um, you don't have to use a fancy system. Uh, Dennis still uses a safeguard system, I think, right? It's very simple, carbon paper type system, keeps track of everything. But the trick is to have a system that works for you. Have a system that works for you. So things you want to check on. You want to make sure you're paying your, uh, uh, reconciling your, your checkbooks and your accounts each month. If you're not doing that, your system's got a flaw. You want to make sure you're reviewing your credit card bills at least monthly. And you can do this online every day if you want to. But if you're not doing that, your system's flawed. Otherwise, people can steal your credit and run up big bills. You want to make sure you're doing your tax returns on time. And if you have any other tax returns, like sales tax, payroll tax returns, make sure they get filed, because often those departments are much more aggressive than, than the IRS is. Okay? We use computers to do a couple things. You know, I, I don't own property with other people anymore, which keeps my requirements for bookkeeping simpler, because it's my money. Uh, you know, my, my main responsibility is to the government now, making sure I can report to the government my income and expenses. When I had partners, I had other responsibilities. I had to report to them and document, uh, you know, our income and expenses. So it's, it's a lot simpler if you just manage your own money, isn't it? A lot simpler if you're just managing your own properties, keeping track of your own money. But if you're keeping track of money for other people, if you own property with other people, computers are, 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 are very helpful because now you can print out statements, you can print out spreadsheets, you, you can furnish these people. The, and and I, I, I base all my spreadsheets on a Schedule E. So I take a, an IRS Schedule E, which has a list of expenses, and I run those across the top of the spreadsheet, and I keep track of our expenses just like I would attack on a tax return. So at the end of the year, when I have to do my tax return, I've got all these spreadsheets. They're, they're laid out just like a Schedule E. It doesn't take much time at all just to total those columns up. The computer will do that for me. And I've got all the information I need to do my taxes. I can literally do my taxes in well under a day. Two or three hours I can do my personal taxes uh, because I have all the information I need. Now, if I hadn't done any bookkeeping all year long and I had to go back and by hand total up all this stuff, it would take a lot longer, wouldn't it? But because every month we post the income and expenses, it doesn't take long to total that stuff up and put it on a Schedule E. Uh, it, it, it's not that complicated. If you've never done your own taxes and you're a new investor, do them this year. Do your own taxes at least once. I'm not going to tell you to become a, a master tax preparer here, but do your own taxes at least once so you understand how that tax form works 
and, and how the numbers get in those spots. And it gets you thinking about uh, how you want to, uh, to operate your business sometimes. Uh, we still do all our own accounting in-house, and then we do our own tax return in-house draft form, and we take it to a CPA, and we get the CPA to look at it and see if they make any improvements and give us any suggestions on how we can pay less or see anything, any tax law changes coming down the road that are going to affect us. And, you know, we do it as close as we can. I, I am not the kind of guy who's trying to avoid paying the last dime in taxes because it takes a lot of effort to beat them out of that last dime. And because we're paying off debt in this phase of our life and we, our rents are going up, and I'm very thankful for that, we're starting to pay more taxes than we have before. But that's okay. We've got more money than we had before. So it all kind of works out. But when, as I said earlier, when you're first starting, you won't pay any taxes for a long time. If you're a new investor and you're on, a, on the road to, to, to buy 20 houses over the next 10 years, your tax bill will be very small for a long period of time. Use a separate bank account for your investments. Don't mingle that with your personal account. And by having a separate bank account, you can really kind of track how you're doing. Back when I had partners, and I had half a dozen partners at one time, I would have a separate bank account for each partnership, each co-ownership of property, because then if somebody called me up and wanted to know how we were doing, I could immediately look in that checkbook, this is before computers, and I could see exactly how we're doing. I could, know, I could tell them how much money we had in that account. I could go back through the checks and the deposits and very quickly reconstruct the income and expenses for that account for that year. Uh, it was a very simple way of doing things. Could you still do that? Could you still have a separate checkbook for each entity you have? And you should have, if you have a corporation or an LLC or even a trust, you probably should have a separate checkbook for that entity uh, because if you co-mingle all that stuff in one account, it's just a mess trying to straighten it all back out again. So, so use, that's a very simple way to keep, keep, keep uh, your money separate. A couple of quick questions. Yes. The next paragraph on uh, land trust. Using land trust to hold. Yeah, using land trust to hold separate title does not create the need for checking accounts and the beneficiary reports the income expenses on your own tax return. Land trust is, a, is the best way just to separate ownership on the property records. It's the cheapest way. It's an easy way everybody should use. And you do not create the need to file separate tax returns with a land trust. Do you have any asset protection? Not really. But it keeps your name separate, which is, is a, a, not a bad first start. The, the one disadvantage, of course, of a lot of these uh, strategies for putting assets and names that aren't your names is now you've got a challenge getting insurance. You've got a challenge with other parts of your life, you know, because the insurance guys don't like it when you hide out and they can't figure out who owns something. Uh, so the insurance rates go up if you can get insurance at all. It gets to be more of a battle. Okay. Delegating management to others on the next page. Long distance property management has many challenges. Okay. So but before you do it, and I'm not saying not to do it, but I'm saying before you do it, figure out what it's going to cost you to do it. Uh, management fees typically uh, get paid out of the first dollars collected. So you, you, you know, it really eats into your cash flow. When you hire people to manage for you, it becomes inefficient on a regular basis uh, because they're not as good at it as you're going to be. Possible fraud. Uh, people sometimes have a problem where they collect the rent and they forget to make your mortgage payments. So I'm going to give you a list of things to do in a second, but one is not let other people make your payments. And then the mental anguish, you know, just a lack of control about having somebody else trying to manage your property and not doing a good job. It, it, you, you think that by hiring somebody else to do a job for you, either an employee or a manager, that's going to make your life better. And that's not always the case, is it? Because if they don't do the job well, now you start, you know, aggravate you that they're not doing the work well. So it, 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 it's not always a good solution. So if you have to hire management on the next page, base compensation on long-term profits, not short-term gross income. The problem I have with most managers is they want to get paid on gross income. Well, it's to their advantage to increase the gross income in a property. And what's the best way to increase gross income? Put bad tenants in there. Think about it. Won't bad tenants pay more rent? Sure. Five college kids always pay more rent than a nice little family with a couple of kids, right? They're, they can get more gross income by putting tenants in there that'll create a lot of gross income. But what else will they create? Problem. Expenses. Expenses. They'll create expenses, right? So the net income may not be any higher. But if you pay somebody based on gross income, not net income, then you can have a problem. Then you can have a problem. Uh, don't trust managers to make critical payments. Critical payments being mortgage payments, tax payments, insurance payments. You can lose properties if they don't make these payments. 
And if they're collecting a rent far, far away, and they're supposed to be making your payments, that's not a good plan. So if I had somebody remotely collecting rent from me, I'd want them to send the rent to me here in my town, and I'd want to be making the loan payments and the tax payments and the insurance payments just to make sure they got made, because those are critical payments. Sign a long-term contract with a manager. The other problem I've had with managers over the years is you get a good one, they only last for a year or two, and they move on. Now you've got to go find another good one. And if you're out of town, you know, if the house is in Arizona and you're in Florida, pretty hard to go find a new manager. That's a, that's a tough thing to do. So if you're going to hire out-of-town management, try to set up a situation where they agree to stay with you for a long period of time. And the way you'll get them to do that is to give them a bonus at the end of a long period of time. Say, so if you stay with me five years, you get X dollars. Or 10 years, you get X dollars. And reward them for a long service. Because if you, if you have to find a new manager every two or three years, uh, that's going to cost you a lot of money. Consider selling a manager an option to buy one half interest coupled with a net lease on the whole property. And I've done this over and over again with different people, and it, it works pretty well. And you can negotiate the option price, you can negotiate the rent price, but I would much rather make a deal with somebody. If I wanted to buy a house in Austin, Texas, okay, I would find somebody who lived in Austin, Texas, maybe Randy, and I'd say, Randy, I will rent you this house for the next 10 years for 800 bucks a month. Now, can you make any money off of that? And the answer better be, yeah, I know how to make money off of that because I can raise rents over 10 years. Now, the 800 bucks a month may not give you much profit today, but it should give you a lot of profit over 10 years. And in addition to that, I'll give you an option to buy a percentage of it. So you'll participate in the profits as it goes up as long as you take care of this house and then we never have to talk about it for the next 10 years. I don't want to hear about it. I just want your check every month for the next 10 years. Now, I'm not asking him to pay the mortgage payments. I'll make the mortgage payments, but I want him to collect a rent and send me a fixed amount. Now I have fixed income. I can make the payments, taxes, and insurance. I'm making money on my end. He's making money on his end. But now I have something a lot better than just a manager that's making 50 bucks a month. I have a manager that's probably making more than that, hopefully, over the long run. Plus, he has this, this bonus at the end. If he'll hang with me 10 years, he gets 25% or 50% of the profits, whatever we negotiate. So he'll have a nice paycheck coming out of the long run. Sell a property to your manager and keep an option to buy back part interest or finance it with an equity participation note. It's getting a little, little complicated for this class, but an equity participation note says that as a property goes up in value, the lender gets part of that increase in value. It can also say as the rents go up, as the income goes up on this property, that the lender is entitled to part of that income increase. And by tying the payments of this note to the increase in income and increase in value, the lender now looks like an owner. But what's the difference between being a lender and an owner? Who gets to do the management? The owner gets to do the management. Who has the liability? The owner has the liability. So the lender probably doesn't have much liability. The lender's position, think about a bank. Bank doesn't have a lot of liability for property. Now, in my mind, they should have more than they have, but the laws are set up to protect lenders. So if I'm a lender in this situation, and I lend somebody money, and, and, and down the road, we're going to participate in the profits. As the rents go up, I get more income. As the property goes up in value, when I get paid off, I get more principal. That's a pretty safe position to be in. And so if, you, if you're trying to get out of management of a property and you have somebody on the other side that wants to buy this house and operate it, not to live there as, as a personal residence, but they want to, to, to buy this property and rent it out to somebody and make a profit over the next 10 years, using an equity participation note allows you to sell it to them maybe at a bargain price today so they can start making money today, but to participate in the profits. And, and if you believe rents and prices are going to go up, you'll get to participate in them. Next page, Schaub's 10 Never Break Rules of Management. And I think we've covered a bunch of these. I'll see if there's anything we've missed. No, I think we've covered them all. So you can come back and read them again, but we're not going to read them again to you right now. Avoiding landlord burnout, rewarding yourself in the next page. A couple of things you can do if you're feeling down. Number one, get rid of your, your least favorite tenant. Just get rid of that tenant. If you know who your, your worst tenant is, 
wake up in the morning and just raise your rent 300 bucks and see what happens. See if they hang around. You know, at some point you, you might start liking them. Yeah, you start liking them. Okay. So get rid of your least favorite property. I did this for years. And I used to have more properties than I have now. And I gave myself a Christmas present every year. I would get rid of the one property I liked the least. Okay? I just say, I don't like it anymore. I'm going to get rid of it. Now, I didn't give it away. Now, I gave some of them away. I literally gave some of them away. But generally, I would sell them to somebody, sell them on terms, sell them cheap, just get rid of them. Because my life got so much better by not owning that property. You know, I got rid of the worst tenant, the worst property. It's amazing how much more cheerful you get after that. <laughs> Contract out the jobs you like to lease. If there's something you're not good at, okay, just pay somebody else to do it. You, you can do things that you're good at and make a lot of money. And all of us have some things we're really talented at and other things we're not talented at. You know, if you don't know how to fix your computer, spending days trying to fix your computer is probably not a good thing for you to do. You know, you should get somebody else to fix your computer that knows how to do it. They can do it faster. So think about what you're not good at. Pay somebody to do it. Hire employees to do jobs better than you can. I've had a number of employees. I've had very good relationships with my employees. I've always felt that I had better control over employees than I had independent contractors. And if I was starting over again today, I would hire people to work for me. And employees should make you money. You know? Employees should make you money. You, you have a bunch of control over what your employees do. You can tell them what to do, when to do it, where to do it, how to do it. Uh, you don't have that kind of control over independent contractors. And people argue that independent contractors have less liability, and I'm not sure that's a good argument. Uh, you can insure your employees, and I never had a problem with any of my employees. So I, uh, I think employees can be a good thing. And, and uh, you know, things that you can't do. Again, going back to things you're not good at, hire people to do that. Continue to improve your skills by continuing your education. You're doing a good job of that today. And enjoy wealth by spending it and sharing it. You know, if I've written in, in any of your books today, I've, I've always write the same thing. I say, build wealth, enjoy it, share it. Because if you don't enjoy and share wealth, what's it all about? You know, you've got to have a good time with it and, and sharing with other people, sharing with friends, sharing with folks who don't have as much. That's always good stuff. You, you borrow is not a term I was using there. I, I'm, I'm sharing, sharing, not lending. I didn't say lend. Yeah. Now, there's, there's a difference between lending and sharing, isn't there? You know? And it's like, it's like lending money to your relatives. That's really not a good plan. Okay? The plan is to give money to your relatives because they're not going to pay you back anyway. And you'll feel much better about the gift than you will the lending part. Okay? Next, up, next page, a couple points under the conclusion. Landlording is a very predictable path to wealth. Okay, it's not a straight road. There's bumps in this road. But if you look around this room, and hopefully you've got to meet some people who have been doing this for a while, uh, you'll see a lot of happy people in this room. There's a lot of folks that have had great success in buying property, and we've all seen ups and downs in the market, but we're all still here. You know, there's a big group in this room that have been doing this for 20 or 30 or 40 years, some of them, and uh, with smiles on their faces. So it's a very predictable way to do this. And what we've talked about today, I hope it's been meaningful to you. I hope you have related to it. And you can go home and say, I can do that. This stuff really works. It's not that hard. And, and you've got the documentation. So go back and study this. And, and you know, you, you may have to go back and reread some of this stuff to make sense out of it. But, but do that. Continue to develop your skills. Treat your tenants as valuable assets. They're, they're worth a lot of money to you. But hold them to a high standard. You know, don't let your tenants uh, slip away. Don't let them get away with stuff. Uh, you know, if, 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 you, if you're going to use this discount plan... Make sure you get a good security deposit and then enforce the discount. Don't, don't let them pay late and still take a discount. When you have a problem, deal with it as soon as you can. Don't, don't, don't worry about it. Just deal with it. When you have a problem you can solve by writing a check, write the check. Make it go away. Is it easier to make money? It's pretty easy to make money, isn't it? If, if you stew over some problem that's causing you trouble for years, does that cost you anything? It costs you a lot of profits, okay? And, I, and some of the bigger mistakes I've made over the years is holding on to properties that were losing money for too long. I should have just gotten rid of them. You take the loss, get rid of them, because then what can you do? You can go out and buy something else. It frees you up to go out and make a good deal and make the money back someplace else. So, so move on. Never make threats. Take action. If, if there's something that's appropriate to do, don't tell people you're going to do it. Just do it. Nobody can give you a hard time unless you let them. That's one of Valerie's favorite statements. Uh, and, and it's true. I mean, you know, a tenant can sit there and yell at you and you can just smile at them if you know you're in the right. Others people lack of planning, causing a crisis does not make it an emergency for you. A friend, a friend of mine used to have that over his desk. You know, somebody shows up in your office and they've got an emergency. Whose emergency is it? 
It's their emergency. You didn't cause the, unless you cause the emergency, right? Don't, you don't have to embrace this emergency. You can sit there and figure out if you can help, but don't let it become your emergency. Uh, you're going to learn to lead your tenants, or they're going to learn to lead you. It's going to go one way or the other, isn't it? It's going to, so, so lead your tenants. Be a good leader. Inspire your tenants to do what, the best they can. Uh, help them be part of the, uh, your management team and, uh, and make them feel good about that. And when I have people who, who are having trouble, they're having struggles, or having trouble paying the rent, I try to inspire them. I try to say, you can do that. I know you can survive. I know you can come back. And by talking to people that way, they do many times. You know? and, and that makes everybody pretty happy. Success comes from executing a well-thought-out plan. And you have the plan now. So execute. Thank you very much. It's been a great day.